What's up, guys? Welcome to the Mana Fix, where we cover commander deck techs across various archetypes, budgets, and themes. Ikoria just dropped, and boy, is this set full of awesome commanders. I wanted to bring attention to one of the commanders that has some serious combo potential. Nethroi Apex of Death is a 5-5 legendary cat nightmare beast with death touch and lifelink for two generic and one of each Abzan color. Nethroi has mutate for four generic mana, one Selesnia hybrid, and two black, so seven total. It says, when this creature mutates, return any number of target creatures with total power 10 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this is a massive reanimation spell stapled onto a commander. There are a few different ways you can go with this, but seeing the power level of this, it made me want to just go as hard as I possibly can and make this deck as powerful as I can. This isn't going to be a tier 1 CEDH deck by any means, I'm definitely not an expert in that field, but I did want to build it to be as powerful as I can make it. So this is a reanimator combo deck. We're going to be filling up our graveyard with some self-mill dredge type effects, and then either mutating our commander or casting another recursion spell in our deck to bring our creatures back to the battlefield and combo out with them. This may take more than a few turns to pull off, and because of that, we're going to run plenty of removal as well as hate bears to slow down our opponents while we're digging for our combo pieces. Now let's dig into the 99 to see how this deck is going to play. Now that mutate ability on Nethroi is 7 mana, so we're going to want plenty of ramp to get us there faster. Avacyn's Pilgrim and Elves of Deep Shadow are both 1 green mana for a creature that taps for 1 mana. Avacyn's Pilgrim will add white, and Elves of Deep Shadow will add a black and deal 1 damage to us. Llanowar Elves and Birds of Paradise are similar. Llanowar Elves taps for a green, and Birds taps for one of any color. Deathrite Shaman is another 1 drop. His first ability allows us to exile a land from a graveyard to add 1 mana of any color. His other two abilities won't be used quite as much, but can be useful in putting a stop to graveyard synergies or for generating some life gain. Bloom Tender and Faberro Elder are also great ramp cards. Bloom Tender is a 2-drop that has a potential to tap for one of each of our colors. Fae Elder's ability does the exact same thing, but it requires white mana. Interestingly enough though, this color requirement helps it to tap for one more mana on its own than a Bloom Tender would be able to. The last creature Ram Carver running is Wood Elves. Now this creature is great not only because of the fact that it puts a forest card into play untapped, but also because it's a creature card that can be reanimated, allowing us to use it more than once to grab our dual lands and quickly set up a stable mana base. Now we're running some artifacts to ramp us as well. These cards are going to ramp us very quickly to help us get to that mutate ability a lot earlier. Now keep in mind, I tried to make this deck as optimal as I possibly could. So with that said, Mana Vault and Mana Crypt are fantastic additions that are going to boost us ahead by multiple turns. And obviously, it would be stupid not to run Soul Ring as well. Drawing cards is another important element to a combo deck. First up we have Dark Confidant and Sylvan Library. Dark Confidant is going to draw us an extra card at our upkeep, but will lose life equal to its converted mana cost. Luckily, 79 of the cards in our deck are 2 CMC or less, so this won't hurt us all that much. Sylvan Library allows us to draw two additional cards at our draw step. We can then pay four life for each card that we want to keep beyond the first. What I love about Sylvan Library in a more competitive setting is its synergy with fetch lands. If we draw into or have a fetch land in hand, we can play that in our first main phase and shuffle away the cards that we kept on top. This will give us a whole new set of three cards at our next draw step, which is amazing. Phyrexian Arena draws us an extra card at our upkeep and deals one damage to us. Skull Clamp is a fantastic draw engine in this deck. With plenty of ways to sacrifice our creatures, Skull Clamp is going to be drawing us a ton of cards. Also, believe it or not, there are 18 creatures in this deck with one toughness that'll just die immediately when we equip Skull Clamp to them. Doing this may even trigger one of the death triggers that we have such as Grim Harrowspecs or Midnight Reaper. Grim Harrowspecs is a 3-2 human wizard for 3 that draws us a card every time a non-token creature we control dies. Midnight Reaper does the exact same thing, but it also deals 1 damage to us. And finally, Runic Armasaur is a 2-5 creature that's going to draw us a card every time one of our opponents activates an ability of a land or creature that's not a mana ability. Thrasios, Stripmine and Wasteland, Vexing Shusher, and Yawgmoth are just a few examples of this that you might see in a more competitive meta. Now we're going to need a few cards in the deck that will help us get cards into our graveyard. Seder Wayfinder and Grizzly Salvage are both easy ways to do this. 
Seder Wayfinder's ETB allows us to look at the top four cards, keep one land, and put the rest into our graveyard. Grizzly Salvage is similar, but instead of on a creature, this is on a 2CMC instant. This one also looks at five cards instead of four, and allows us to get a creature instead of a land if we want to. Life from the Loam is a classic dredge staple. It's a sorcery for two that returns up to three lands from our graveyard to our hand, but it also has dredge four, so if this card is in our graveyard, when we would draw a card, we could instead put the top four cards of our library into our graveyard and put Life from the Loam into our hand. So this is going to fill up our graveyard very quickly in addition to almost guaranteeing that we hit a land drop on every turn. Finally, we have the granddaddy of all dredge cards and the first all-star of the deck. Hermit Druid is a 1-1 Druid for 1 green and 1 other. If we pay 1 green and tap Hermit Druid, we reveal cards from the top of our library until we reveal a basic land card. We put that card into our hand and the rest into our graveyard. Now this deck runs only one basic forest, so when we activate this, there's a very good chance that we'll have loads of cards in our graveyard. The hope is that this will dump all of our combo pieces into the graveyard all at once, so that when we're ready to mutate Nethroi or cast another recursion spell, we're able to combo out right then and there. This is by far the best combo enabler in our deck, so it's going to be one of the first things, if not the first thing, that we tutor for. Speaking of tutors, any deck that is trying to be competitive or semi-competitive is going to need plenty of tutors, and this list has no shortage of them. Demonic Tutor and Vampiric Tutor are obvious inclusions. Demonic Tutor will get any card from our deck for just 2 mana, and Vampiric Tutor is an instant for 1 black that'll get us any card to the top of our library. Diabolic Intent is essentially a demonic tutor with an additional cost that requires us to sacrifice a creature. This quote-unquote cost may actually benefit us if we're looking to trigger something like a Skull Clamp or Grim Horror Specs. Now we have a couple more cheap tutors that are more specific. Worldly Tutor will let us get any creature from our deck and put it on top of our library. Creatures that are combo enablers and combo pieces themselves are often going to be our targets with this spell. Enlightened Tutor can find an artifact or enchantment for just one white. With this, we may choose to find a sack outlet like Ashnod's Altar. If we're in the early game, we may want ramps such as Soul Ring, or we may tutor for a repeatable tutor such as Survival of the Fittest. This is an excellent repeatable tutor where we can pay a green and discard a creature card to search for a creature card and put it into our hand. This is great because we can ditch one of the creatures that belongs in the graveyard to get another one that will help us smooth out our draws, tutor, or generate some other kind of value for us. Fauna Shaman is almost the exact same thing, but on a creature. Obviously, it's a bit slower because this is a tap ability on a creature, but being able to search for any creature once each turn is still pretty darn good. Fiend Artisan is similar to these cards. Again, this is a tutor ability stapled to a creature, but it's going to require a bit more mana to activate and forces us to sack a creature. Birthing Pod is one of the best repeatable tutors, if not the best one in our deck. This one costs 3 generic and 1 Phyrexian green for an artifact that tutors creatures and puts them directly into play. This takes very little mana to activate and we can do it once each turn. Also, something noteworthy of these two cards is that they require us to sacrifice creatures which, again, could potentially be generating us some additional value if we have one or more death triggers on the board. Not to mention the fact that those creatures we sacrifice can be reanimated later. Finally, this is a reanimator deck and we want creatures in our graveyard. Entomb and Buried Alive are going to do just that. Entomb allows us to search our library for any creature and put it into our graveyard for one black. Buried Alive does the same thing, but for three mana, it allows us to search for up to three creature cards and put them into our graveyard. Now, as I said before, it may take us some time to pull off one of our combos, and one thing we're going to want to do is slow down our opponents a bit. So with that, let's go over the hate bears that are going to make our friends hate us. First, we have Eidolon of Rhetoric and Spirit of the Labyrinth. Eidolon of Rhetoric says each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. Having this creature stick to the battlefield is really going to help slow down the game dramatically. Spirit of the Labyrinth says each player can't draw more than one card each turn. This will prevent our opponents from getting ahead with card advantage. Now remember, both of these effects will apply to us as well. The nice thing about running hate bears in a deck like this is that we'll often have the ability to sacrifice them if we need to, since we're running several ways to sacrifice our creatures. Next, we have a new card from Ikoria. Dranith Magistrate will cost one white and one other for a creature that says your opponents can't cast spells from anywhere other than their hands. So obviously, this affects a few things, one being some recursion effects like Yawgmoth's Will or Past in Flames, 
but the most important thing that this does is to stop our opponents from being able to cast their commanders. This will have a pretty meaningful effect on most of our opponents. It's safe to say that most commander decks like having access to their commander. Some even rely on it as a main value engine in their deck. To shut that card down is devastating to a lot of players. Next is Thalia, Guardian of Thraven. This creature makes all non-creature spells cost an additional generic mana to play. 32 of the cards in our deck are creature spells, so those won't be affected and our opponents won't be able to cast their spells as easily as they otherwise would be. Aven Mind Sensor is an excellent card, particularly when you're playing in a slightly more competitive meta where tutors run rampant. If an opponent wants to tutor with this on the battlefield, they'll only be able to look at the top four cards of their library rather than their whole deck. Also, this card only affects our opponents, so our tutors will still work as normal. The other great thing about this card is that it has flash, and as such can be used in response to someone casting a tutor spell. This bird will resolve first, and it'll essentially force them to waste that tutor that they just cast. Now we have a couple artifact hate cards in Kataki Wars Wage and Collector... Oof? Weef? Oofy? Whatever it is. Anyways, Kataki Wars Wage is going to make our opponents pay one for each artifact they own at their upkeep. For each artifact, if they choose not to do this, they have to sacrifice that artifact. This is going to do one of two things. Either they'll pay for it to keep their artifacts and that will restrict their mana use, or they'll lose all their artifacts. Collector Oof, yeah I'm just going to go with Oof, is probably better as it just straight up says activated abilities of artifacts cannot be used. We only have 7 artifacts in the deck, so this won't affect us too much, but if we end up needing to use an activated ability of an artifact, remember, this deck has tons of sacrifice outlets, so we should be able to get rid of it if we need to. Of course, another way to stall the game is removing our opponent's permanence. Swords to Plowshares will exile a creature for just 1 white mana, and Nature's Claim will destroy an artifact or enchantment for 1 mana. These are also both instant speed answers, which is important in a semi-competitive meta. Abrupt Decay and Assassin's Trophy are versatile removal spells that can be used in a pinch and take care of any permanent type. Anguished Unmaking is a 3CMC instant that exiles any non-land permanent. Fiend Hunter can exile a creature when it enters the battlefield, so it can be used as removal if need be, but it has another purpose we'll talk about in a moment. Finally, we're also running Toxic Deluge as it's the cheapest board wipe our colors have to offer. Now let's get into the fun part here, the combos. Karmic Guide, Revelark, Safi Eric Stodder, and Fiend Hunter are all involved in the different variations of combos that are used in this deck. The most common one that's used is Revelark and Karmic Guide. So let's say we have a creature out on the battlefield and we're able to mutate Nethroi onto it. In doing this, we reanimate Karmic Guide, Revelark, Blood Artist, and Viserysir. With the Viserysir, we sacrifice Karmic Guide first and then Revelark. When Revlark leaves the battlefield, it returns two creatures with power two or less. We'll return Karmic Guide and something else. When Karmic Guide enters the battlefield, we're able to target Revlark and get it back. Now we have the same exact board state as when we started. So we just repeat this over and over again until all our opponents have taken lethal damage from our Blood Artist. Now this is the basic shell that we work off of, but it can be done with a few different cards. For example, Safi Eric's Daughter can take the place of Karmic Guide. We sacrifice Safi with his own ability targeting Revlark, then sacrifice Revlark to Ashnod's altar, triggering its ability and returning Safi. Also, Safi's ability will resolve when Revlark dies and return it to the battlefield, meaning we now have an infinite loop. Actually, Safi Eric's can replace either creature in the combo because it also works with Karmic Guide. Fiend Hunter can also work with Karmic Guide. When Fiend Hunter enters the battlefield, we exile Karmic Guide. Then, we sacrifice Fiend Hunter to our Ashnod's Altar, which returns Karmic Guide to the battlefield. Karmic Guide's ETB triggers, and we return Fiend Hunter, which again exiles Karmic Guide, and we've just come back around to the start of the loop. Now that we know what we're looking to do to win the game, let's discuss All-Star number 2 and the best combo enabler in the deck, Protean Hulk. This turns our 4-card combo into a 2-card combo. As long as we have Protean Hulk in a sack outlet on the battlefield, we should be able to win the game. All we have to do is sacrifice Protean Hulk to a sack outlet and use the trigger to search for Karmic Guide and another 1CMC creature. When Karmic Guide enters, we'll get Protean Hulk back and then sacrifice it again to search for Safi Eric's Daughter, Blood Artist, and Grand Abolisher. Now we can start the Safi Karmic Guide combo and kill our opponents off with the Blood Artist. Now you might be wondering how we plan to get Protean Hulk onto the battlefield. I mean, it costs 7 mana. 
Well, we always have Nethroi, which will be able to reanimate it from our command zone, but that also costs 7 mana. Don't we have a cheaper way to do this? Well, that's where our reanimation spells come in. It's much more efficient to reanimate Protean Hulk than to hardcast it. Animate Dead is a cheap recursion spell that brings back any creature with almost no drawback, aside from a slight power reduction. Reanimate is the classic staple that is run in pretty much every build like this. One black mana to get any creature back from our graveyard to the battlefield is darn efficient and we don't really care about the loss of life. Apprentice Necromancer is a two mana creature that can be sacrificed to get a creature back to the battlefield for a turn. We have to sacrifice that creature at the end step, but we should be able to accomplish what we need to do in that turn anyways. And being forced to sacrifice the creature is actually a good thing if we're targeting Protean Hulk with this. Now we have two spells that can bring back multiple creatures at once. Living Death and Wake the Dead. Living Death essentially swaps all creatures on the battlefield with all creatures in graveyards. The idea is that when we cast this, all of our combo pieces will already be in our graveyard, so we'll be able to combo out and win the game and we won't have to worry about what our opponents were able to bring back with it. Same goes for Wake the Dead. This one is an instant which is great because it allows us to wait for the most opportune time to combo out. Finally, we have Dread Return, which just reanimates a single creature, but it has a flashback cost of sacrificing three creatures. Remember that whole Hermit Druid thing we were talking about earlier? If we dump our library into our graveyard, we'll still be able to cast this from our graveyard. We'll most likely be targeting Protean Hulk at that point to immediately sacrifice it and begin searching for our combo pieces. Now to top off this deck tech, let's go over the utility lands in the deck. Phyrexian Tower and High Market both have tap abilities that will act as sack outlets for us. Phyrexian Tower is great because it adds two black mana when we sacrifice a creature with it. Dakmore Salvage will help us get cards into our graveyard with its dredge ability. Ancient Tomb is going to help us ramp up more quickly. Indatha Triome can tap for any of our colors, but it also has cycling for three, so we can ditch it late game when we don't need the land. Finally, Strip Mine is here to deal with any problematic lands our opponents may have. Anyways, that'll wrap up today's deck tech. Thanks for watching! What are your thoughts on this commander? Do you have any recommendations that might make this deck better? Let me know about it in the comments. And if you liked the video, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you don't miss out on any new deck techs. You can also follow us on Twitter at the Manifix MTG. Thanks for getting your fix with me today. Stay safe out there and peace out, guys.